Hello, my name is Rosalyn Love and I'm from the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, known as ASNAC for short. And I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Professor Paul Russell. Hello, Paul. Would you like to tell us which part of the ASNAC uh, course you're responsible for? Yes, I'm responsible for the teaching in medieval Welsh. Um, that's the, the language and literature uh, course. Um, and medieval Welsh is one of a range of uh, language and literature courses that we teach um, and it's one of the ones as a Celtic language alongside med the medieval Irish course as well. Um, and the aim of the course is for you to learn from scratch uh, medieval Welsh and to learn uh, uh, about its fantastic wide-ranging literature um, with uh, some of the best literature you'll never have heard of. Um, it, you know, it, this is, this is uh, think King Arthur, think of the earliest material on King Arthur, think of the fantastic shape-changing uh, tales in the four branches of the Mabinogi, uh, a range of literature that includes all the Geoffrey of Monmouth material as well, fantastic poetry that goes all the way back to poetry about the Old North, about the Britonic speakers of southern Scotland, um, and all the way through to uh, the great poetry uh, composed for the Princes of Wales um, and on through to Davidak Gwilym and the poets of that period where you see a very, very different type of poetry. So um, very wide range of fantastic literature mm -hmm. and a, a language that is um, actually amongst the Aznak languages, the students always say oh this is relatively easy we don't have any cases <laughs> unlike most of the other uh, as that language is so uh, in other words it's 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 a language that is quite easy to get through the basics to a point where you can actually uh, read a text pretty quickly and feel comfortable with it fantastic how, how different is medieval welsh from from modern welsh which would be one of the connections with with things that people coming to do this course might have encountered beforehand Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, it's just worth stressing that, of course, it's a, it is, it is one of the languages where, we, where one might have people coming who have encountered modern Welsh. Um, but just to stress at the beginning that this is a language, all our languages we learn from scratch. So, yeah. uh, as we were, you don't have to have that background. But if you do have um, some uh, modern Welsh, then it, what we're thinking of is probably the same kind of difference between um modern english and chaucer but maybe perhaps a bit later than chaucer um it, it's fair to say that the prose is generally much much more straightforward and would be familiar to a speaker the poetry tends to be a bit trickier because it's using much more kind of old-fashioned archaic types of words and structures but nevertheless it's that kind of difference it's not like modern english to old english it's not that kind of difference in terms of the language and what connections can one make between Welsh literature and some of the other parts of the the Asnac course? Well, it's it's this is very interesting, and this, this is these are the kind of scholarly debates we explore, and um, particularly um, you know students who do the the medieval Welsh course will quite often do medieval Irish as well because these languages are structurally quite similar, and one can make very interesting and illuminating. Um, uh, comparisons and draw parallels between medieval Welsh literature and, and medieval Irish literature as well because um, you know there's been scholars debate about how much of uh, say Welsh literature might have been dependent on contacts with Ireland or drawing on a very similar type of um, you know narrowed ancestral narratives if you like and so on and so forth so um, that's one way of doing it another way of doing it which is which is actually in the past been kind of less explored but is actually the the kind of connection between um, medieval Welsh literature and um, certainly later old English literature and early middle English literature because these are languages that would have been adjacent and been spoken by the same groups same. of people in the Welsh marches on the borders between Wales and England. Yeah, really interesting. If I were going to start the, the medieval Welsh course, what would, what would be the first text that I'd, I've learned enough Welsh to be reading in your class? 
Well, we I try and get get uh, get everybody reading um, a text really well within the middle of the first term. So I'm always my my schedule normally gets one to about kind of week four, week five, somewhere there. And actually, we've got a text in front of us at that point, and it's a real text. It's not been edited or anything mm -hmm. else. And this is a very short little tale called in English, uh, The Encounter of Thies and Flavellis, in Welsh, uh, Cyfranci the Flavellis. Um, and this is a little tale about brother, two brothers who are kings in, in Britain and in France, who actually, uh, and, and, and um, very timely at the moment, is, is, is that the, uh, Britain is being attacked by various plagues. <laughs> And the uh, and he goes off to his brother in France to find out what he has to do. And brother says, "Well, you need to do this, this, and this to resolve this, and so on and so forth." Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting tale. Not least because it's a tale about um, well, about gormes, this is the Welsh word for an oppression, these plagues, but also about the fact that um, weirdly for Welsh literature, we have a couple of royal brothers who actually get on with one another. I think that's one of the key points about this tale mm -hmm. is that brothers who get on with each other in medieval Welsh literature and in in, in royal families very rare indeed. Very rare, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Now, if we were having an in-person open day, then one of the joys would be to get to see real manuscripts. And I happen to know that um, one of the libraries we might have gone to would be uh, the Wren Library in Trinity, and there's uh pretty well-known um, manuscript that's of interest to people who are studying Welsh, which uh, it would be fantastic, Paul, if you could show us a bit and tell us a bit about. Yes, yeah, so this Courtesy is... Courtesy of Trinity College. Courtesy of Trinity College. This is manuscript 0.7.1. Um, this is a manuscript of Welsh law. Now, just a little bit of background with this. They, um, uh, and you can see, you might be able to see on this image here, uh, just to say most of the rest of the manuscript is in much, much better condition than the front page because very often with these manuscripts, these manuscripts were bound so that front page would have got a lot of wear. So it always tends to be a murky and battered. But across the top, you'll see a later librarian has written Leges Hawali Da across the top there. Uh, the laws of Hawulva, who was a king of Wales um, in the early medieval period, and uh, it's worth pointing out that Wales had its own has its uh, had its own legal system all the way through to the Act of Union in the 16th century, um, and it's a very very distinctive type of law. And there are quite a lot of legal manuscripts surviving from medieval Wales of. Uh, from different parts of Wales, because there's several different versions of the laws of Hawaldar around that were used in different parts of Wales. Um, now, this is a manuscript uh, of the laws of Hawaldar that come from southwest Wales, uh, a, a group associated with a lawyer called Blegurid. Um, and of this particular group, well, several things we know about this group, this is one of the most uh, prolific in terms of its manuscripts, there's some 15, 20 manuscripts of this version around um, in different shapes and forms. Um, it's a text that was originally translated into Welsh from Latin, and we have uh, something very close to the Latin and original, so we can actually see how this text was translated. Um, now, this is a particularly interesting example um, for a number of reasons, but I thought I might begin by uh, just showing you some of the features of this manuscript, and let's go to a slightly uh, better preserved page. Um, uh, there we go. Um, where we've got a double page here. You'll see how the text is set out. Uh, big red letters to mark uh, the, the sort of important sections. If we go down, however, to this page here and the bottom of the page. What we have here is what is known as a choir signature. Um, basically, choir is a sort of a, 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 a group of folded pages that are sort of tacked and held together. Um, and in order to make sure that they knew which order these bundles were to be, 
the at the end of a choir they would always put the word which was the beginning the first word of the next choir so you could always keep them in the right order should you, they become disordered so you'll he, see here our text ends up on the main text there with uh, in worth and then you've got an ac ag which means and down in this bottom corner here interestingly this scribe or at least someone who had their hands on this manuscript rather light ornamenting their <laughs> choir signatures and here we have a rather fine little dragon Wonderful. Uh, with an, a red sort of flaming arrow coming out of its mouth um sort of very fine i mean and these are clearly just little quick sketches there's there's wonderful detail in them but at the same time they use the kind of thing you would doodle into the into the bottom of the page um, there's another one of these which i'll show you here as well um uh 30 uh, there we go uh again the end of a choir you can see there's a kind of gap in the manuscript image there between the two pages because they're actually part of two separate bundles and then right down in the bottom here, you'll see there's a much longer word being <laughs> used as the wire signature. And we have a wild boar, bristly wild boar. Now, wild boars were, well, pre very prevalent in, in the medieval world anyway, but um, they also figure significantly in medieval Welsh literature. So you can have these um, great uh, tales, the tale of Kiloch Agolwen, Kiloch and Olwen. It's all about a great boar hunt and they, and and how Kiloch gets the love of his life, Olwen. But there's this great boar hunt, which is the centerpiece of it. And here's a nice bristly boar that presumably ended up on someone's table at one point or another. <laughs> now, this is I mean, this is a law manuscript. It's this is all about how the law worked. Um, and Welsh law is very interesting in a number of ways, and it's very different from English law of the same period. Um, particularly interesting is its, its attitude towards women. Women are allowed to uh, have considerable legal powers in terms of being able to, um, you know, have rights of divorcing their husbands and so on and so forth, and rights of inheritance and so on. Anyway, this particular manuscript is interesting for another reason, so that if we go to, as it were, the last part of this manuscript, um, to the last page of it, um, here, and we go to this topic. Someone has added a different scribe, has added a bit of text there. What I'm interested in this torn little bit at the top here, oh. which is what's known as a colophon. And this talks about the, the manuscript and where it was written and so on and so forth. Now, these things are extremely rare. Um, and this one is particularly rare because it gives us the name of the scribe and where he came from. Wow. So if you look at this and it starts a flama di across the top, a here ends, presumably this book of law, etc., etc., etc. But further down there in the second line, we have the word ascriven, possibly owl or something like that. They're wrote. And then underneath, Gwilim Wasta or Drednewith. So this is the scribe's name, Gwilim Wasta from Drenewith, which wow. is um, next to the castle of Dinevor, which is next to Llandelo, uh in southwest Wales and Carmarthenshire. Mm -hmm. Now, this is particularly interesting because this is the first, the earliest manuscript in, in Welsh where we actually have the scribe's name. Um, and this is particularly interesting. This same scribe also, uh, we know, put his name, uh, has two other manuscripts are in the same hand. Uh, all three are Welsh law manuscripts of this type. Um, we also know something else, namely that this Gwilym Wasta, his name, and probably it's the same person, crops up in a legal document from uh, Dinevor, from Drenewith, um, in 1298. So not only do we have a named manuscript, but we pretty much have more or less a date, namely right at the end of the 13th century. 
he could have been writing it a little later or a little earlier, we don't know, but we've got a date right at the end of the 13th century. And this really helps to pin things down because those kind of details are uh, extremely rare in, in, in manuscripts generally, but particularly in Welsh manuscripts, it's very hard to pin these things down. But this one is become is one of the anchor points. And the very fact that we have his name is important um, because uh, we can we 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 got a place we got a date uh, we got a person uh, um, which is lovely for this kind of thing. Um, also worth pointing out that William Wastar's version of the laws uh, earlier on there's a big section usually in the laws about the laws of court and the, the rights and the privileges of the king and his officers and so on and so forth. And in this text, William Wastar and in all his texts. Um, instead of writing that bit out, he says, oh, we don't do this anymore, and just skips to the next bit. So it's very, very interesting precisely what that means, and it's debated what it means, whether he's, uh, whether he's, because a lot of the later manuscripts also copy these sections of the king, but he maybe just didn't have it in his manuscript, or he's decided since we don't do all this ceremony anymore, we're not going to bother. Um, <laughs> so he's not going to bother copying it. Um, but it's actually extremely interesting as a way of getting in behind how these texts work. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, Gwilym Wasta from Drenewith in uh, the end of the 13th century in a manuscript in Trinity College, Cambridge. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I could ask many more a question, but I think there we, we ought to draw to a conclusion. Thank you so much. Not at all. It's a pleasure.